Okay, so this is my first video. I'll probably make two on phylogenetics, and uh, we're going to focus on this one on how you read phylogenetic trees. So let's go ahead and talk about them and what they are. So phylogenetic trees and cladograms both show the evolutionary uh, relationship between species. Now we're going to talk about what all these branch points mean and uh, how you understand them, but basically uh, these phylogenetic trees and cladograms are hypotheses of how scientists think that the species evolved, right? And so a couple pieces of data that they use, they can use the fossil record, uh, especially if they're extinct old species and that's all we have. So they can use uh, what's called morphological data, which is like structures and shapes to form the different branch points and speciation events. Um, or you can look at DNA sequences or amino acid sequences and from those, you can infer how closely or distantly two species are related based on how many similarities or differences there are in the molecular data. And so another difference between cladograms and phylogenetic trees is that uh, the phylogenetic trees show the like amount of time basically uh, that two groups have been separated. So it's uh, calibrated based on the number of mutations or the number of morphological differences. So if you look at this picture here behind my face, um, if we compare like this cute little brown uh, and white rat near the um, corner, I, I can't really write on it, and like down near the bottom, the guinea pig, right? So like how closely or distantly they are related and when do they share a common ancestor is going to be based because these are living species and they'd have access to DNA. So you can compare the DNA sequences and then draw a pretty accurate phylogenetic tree. Okay, but let's go ahead and talk about these trees and uh, what they what they are and how you read them. So if we look at this tree or these diagrams right here, they both mean the same thing. Now, when we start towards the bottom, the bottom means like further in the evolutionary past. Uh, and then as you move up or in the case of the like triangle shaped one on the right, um, as you move up, uh, we're moving towards the more recent or the present. Now, why I say more recent is because if you're looking at like dinosaurs, for example, that are all extinct, uh, the ones near the top would be the ones that lived the longest or the ones you're studying. And so uh, we want to keep in mind that these lines represent time. Now, time could be hundreds of thousands of years. It could be millions of years. So it depends on the scale of what the organisms are that you're studying. Now, when we look at these trees, uh, these different letters at the top represent the different species being studied. Now, these orange highlighted areas, these branch points, represent times in history or evolutionary history where speciation occurred. So if I look at um, like the idea of speciation, you have a group of organisms and they become isolated from each other, reproductively isolated. Now, whether that's allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation is a different discussion, but somehow you have one group of species that has become separated into two, and now uh, whether it's a prezygotic barrier or a postzygotic barrier, they have become two different groups, two different species. And so wherever they were considered to be one species is represented at that orange highlight. And so uh, that area would be where there's the last um, like common ancestor between these three groups here of A, B, and C. So um, up here close to my face, uh, that orange little square between B and C, that would represent the most recent common ancestor between B and C. Okay, so now though, if we look at uh, this phylogenetic tree right here, so some things to like think about and understand. One is that this gray highlighted area is going to represent a shared evolutionary history between all four species. So really any traits that would have shown up in that gray line would be found in all four. So if these represented mammals, for example, and like hair was a trait in that, that showed up evolutionarily in that gray line, all four animals across the top would have hair. 
Now, the lines represent, though, a series of ancestors over time. If this yellow line right here represented millions of years, uh, whatever the species look like at that orange point where they branched, it doesn't look the same today millions of years later. So these uh, lines represent like a series of ancestors. You can kind of think about gradualism with like gradual changes over time uh, to bring us to our present day species. Now, another thing we should point out is that when we look at what these lines represent, this gray line here is the shared evolutionary history of all four species. But then when it branches and it splits between the yellow line and that like mint color line, right? So this line here is the shared evolutionary history for species B, C, and D. Any traits or mutations that occurred in that blue circled area you would find in all three species B, C, and D. That's a shared evolutionary history. Now right here though, where we have this blue highlighted area circled in pink, this, any like mutations or evolution, a genetic drift, natural selection that is occurring um, in this pink highlighted area, that is gonna be unique to species D. So for example, if that was like, let's say these were mammals, and that was uh, the trait of claws that are retractable. Think about like a house cat whose claws can be taken back in, right? If a mutation uh, showed up for retractable claws and then it was selected for by natural selection, you would only find that trait in species D here. It would not be present in A, B, or C. Now, another thing that's important when looking at phylogenetic trees is understanding uh, the last or most recent common ancestor and how different species are related. So looking at this table, arrow number one is pointing to the last common ancestor, or you can phrase it as the most recent common ancestor between A, B, and C, and D, right? So at that point in time was the last time um, there was a common ancestor for all four species. So what we're seeing in this tree is basically divergent evolution, right? They've diverged and become their own species. Now, if we look at arrow number two, that is showing the most recent common ancestor or the last common ancestor for species B, C, and D. We also see at number three here that that is the last or most recent common ancestor for groups B or species B and C. Now, another important thing or fascinating thing is to be able to see who is more or who is the most closely related to whom. And so when we read this, B and C, if we remember that the lines represent time and at the bottom is the past and the top is the most recent, right? So as we move through time, we can see that arrow number three is closest to the present day. So therefore, group species B and C diverged the most recently. So therefore, they are the two species that are the most closely related in this phylogenetic tree. They have the most recent common ancestor. Now, when we look at, let me move my face, uh, just other ways you can think about this tree is that B, is more closely related to species D though, because if we follow it back in time, that recent common ancestor at arrow number two is closer to today than arrow number one. So B has a more recent common ancestor shared with species D than it does with species A. Evolutionarily, species A broke off or diverged longer back in time so A is more distantly related uh, to the other three species. <laughs> You'll get to practice this, I'm sure, in your classes. Now, let's go ahead though and talk about um, what these different branch points mean. Uh-oh, lost my face. Oh, there it is, okay. So when we look at these different um, trees and how uh, you can read them, now, the species across the top, the order isn't that important. Really, you wanna look at the branch points and interpret what that means. Um, so here, the tree on the left, the diagram on the left, means the same thing as the diagram on the right. Now, when you really think about, well, how is that possible? Let's focus on this 
divergent point here. So here's my original, the one you see on the left. Now, what happens is you can twist at that branch point in any direction, and this is gonna mean the same thing. All I did was rotate it. So the diagram on the left and the diagram on the right show the same evolutionary history because the branch points are in the same relative locations. Now, you can also switch, for example, uh, at this node, you can switch it, and it would mean the same thing as well. You can also switch just like B and C, and it would mean the same thing. So again, it's not so much the letters or the species across the top, but rather where are the branch points. If you look at, um, in my diagrams here, like this third image where it goes C, B, D, A, I'm sorry, the third, the second one, you can see now A is way far on the right. Uh, it doesn't mean that A is more evolved than C. It's we're looking at still like the divergent points and the speciation and the, you know, the most recent common ancestors between the different groups and how we interpret the evolutionary relatedness of these organisms. So now as we move on, uh, let's, this is my last slide, I believe. If we look at these four different diagrams, they actually are all showing the same evolutionary relationships. So when we look at like B and C, you can see that is the most, they share the most recent common ancestor in all four of these diagrams. Then D is the next most closely related in all four of these, and then A. So all four of these um, ways to display the information are equal and mean the same thing. All right, all right, so then my next video will talk about how do you draw or create or build these uh, phylogenetic trees and what data do you use to do that? All right, all right, great job.